this. Again, you should be able to see that. <clears throat> and now we wait. Did Moral say first like 40 minutes ago? And now we wait. He did! <laughs> Let me just mute the audio from the stream. <laughs> he's a funny kid. Uh, what was that? Uh, he's a funny kid. Uh, so you've got like chat and stuff open, hey? Cool. You can respond to that. Indeed. Ah, it's AZ Kiwi. I'll put my guitar down now. It's almost serious time. No, that's all right. You can keep playing guitar. It's like the intro music because we don't have intro music. There is no better guitar than the sound of an unamplified electric guitar. <laughs> I actually quite like it's that. It's always annoying yeah. people. So it's, uh, it's that kind of just the clankiness. Clankiness? Would that's how you describe it? Anyway, man, it's been a, it's been a few weeks, hasn't it? Hey, Kiwi. Yeah, it has. Yeah. Jeez, that's because we're not organized. Um, Apparently, it didn't seem bad. That's good. I'll I'll put that on my LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've thought about it. I've been in a few bands over the years, and I cheekily thought about putting that on LinkedIn, but I didn't. Oh, man. And how have you been, Jake? Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. That's good. That's good. How about you? Yeah, you know, just... Life trundles on, I guess. Yeah, that's about how it's been yeah. going. Yeah. Um, oh. I'm still getting echo back, but I don't know if it's my end or your end. Oh, from me? Mm, I don't know. Yeah, it'll be from me. Let me just turn that old that old volume on my speakers down. Is that better? Uh, yeah, probably. Let me... Oh, I'll switch to headphones. No, it's all good. It should be fine. Um, there we go. I've got headphones on now. Cool. We should. We should probably get started. Yeah, let's get started. Um... All right. While Jake's just uh, setting up whatever he's got left to set up, uh, so this week uh, we're doing a, a simple buffer overflow. But rather than like when we've done them in the past, use a like a toy application and it's deliberately designed to be buffer overflowable. Uh, we're using a, um, I mean, I suspect this piece of software, given its provenance, is des was designed to also be buffer overflowable, if I'm being honest. But uh, we went and we had a quick troll through exploit DB to find an app that has a vulnerability that looks relatively straightforward. Um, hopefully, I don't know if you've, you would have seen this one before or not, but oh, what's the app even called again? Uh, it's called PCFTP. PC, yeah, PCFTP server. So, like, who knows if it's still actually used or anything like that? But it's basically a super old FTP app that we just randomly found when searching exploit DB for buffer overflow attacks, and it looks like it's a really straightforward one, which will be good for like an intro video. So we'll sort of show off all of the how to find a buffer overflow, the fuzzing, the shellcode writing, all of that kind of stuff. And then next week and the weeks on in the future, we'll sort of get more and more complicated with the buffer overflows and try and make it a bit of a, a series, I guess. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, you might want to uh, switch the scene, Jake. It still says those guys. You still say those guys. Unless you've already switched it and I'm just... Uh, there we go. Now. Yeah. She magic. Um, cool. So the app that we are exploiting is a Windows app. Um, so I've got two VMs running a Windows app with the actual, a Windows VM with the actual app, and then our remote Kali Linux hacky box. Um, I'm not using our Debian one because it's been a long time since I booted it up and a lot of things were out of date and stuff broke. Whereas 
this all still just works. So uh, yeah, this is a challenge, right? That's why I'm on this one. <laughs> all right. Okay, so let's get into it. So basically, when we start off, we're just going to run the server. Yep. Cool, let that run. <clears throat> oh um, yeah, for, uh, I guess you explain the context. We're running this, we're running the app on Windows, doing a hacky hacky from Carly. Yes. That's, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I already said. But yeah, basically... Yeah, gonna... I just realized I probably zoned out. <laughs> this is how professional we... <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm also trying to order dinner at the same time we're talking. So. Right, that'll be um, right. That's okay. I'll do it. So generally, the way that we find buffer overflows is we send a massively long string as user input and hope that the app crashes. So that's pretty much what we're going to do. Uh, I'm just going to print two and a half thousand a characters and then send them in a ftp request so i already know the ip address of my other vm so i can just log straight in it's got anonymous access so i'm just going to enable or log straight in as anonymous and send a dir command which is a standard ftp command with all of my characters we can see that it if you says, want to know more about how the FTP protocol works, uh, Wikipedia is an excellent resource. Yes, exactly. We're not here to talk about how FTP works or what it is or any of that stuff. Um, so we can see that the command was a good command. There is a FTP command, but then after a little while, the service is not available. And if we look at our Windows box, we can see that the FTP server has crashed. So that's kind of our first indicators that there could potentially be a buffer overflow in here. Other good indicators are like it throws a seg fault or some other exception that the application, some, some other sort of memory related uh, application error, I guess. All it, all it means in short is either uh, it's gone to try and then execute some code, which is just the Unicode uh, like the the byte for the character capital A, and it can't, so it dies. Or seg faults, I think, uh, effectively it ends up trying to jump to a memory location that it doesn't have access to. Yeah, that's exactly. a pretty oh, is that a violation. Yeah, so that's uh, yeah. kind of what we're yeah, going to process not found. Yeah, did you did you miss Windows? That oh, could happen too. Times. Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so now what we're going to do is, yeah, exactly. Test that theory. So yeah. we're using Oli debugger, which is just a free windows debugger tool. There's a technically shareware, I guess. Yeah, pretty much. Um, There's a bunch of them yeah. out there. Um, we're just using Oli because I don't know. I'm familiar with the interface pretty much. There's no, it was, the, it was, it was the, we've done lots of these on like Linux. And you'd use um, EDB or GDB or something like that. Uh, on Windows, you can either use like the Microsoft tools for it, but like they were a bit of a mystery. <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess if we found the right instructions, we would have figured it out. Or Immunity, but like Immunity is old, like Python 2. And to get it, you have to like fill in a form and I think wait for them to send you a link or yeah. find one of the dodgy versions that are floating around the internet, which when you're dealing with security tools, maybe a dodgy version isn't the right way to do it. Exactly. Um, Plus with Python 2 being deprecated, it's not worth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Reese's voice is a bit jumpy. I wasn't sure uh, if that was uh, just me yeah. on Discord or if that was um, coming through no, on the stream as well. It's my audio interface and Discord. I can't sort it out. Okay. It makes for fun. Uh, apologies for a jumpy voice. Um, I'm going to explain kind of what the layout here is. I mean, it's not too, too difficult. Uh, sure. So what we're looking at is basically just the stack uh, in a few different views. So over here, we've got the registers, which was showing data and now isn't. I think I've pressed play too many times. Um, but it'll come back again once we crash the app. 
Um, yeah, that's kind of it. So this is the hex dump of memory, and then this is the stack kind of window, and these are all of the instructions that are yeah, being pretty, run. I, I realize pretty standard debugger view. Yeah, anyway. pretty standard debug view. So now what we're going to do is exit this one because it's crashed and reconnect that password and that should still be in the clipboard. Cool. So this time, once we run this command in our debugger, we can see that it's hit a breakpoint because the app's crashed and there's a access violation. So it's trying to access the memory address 41414141. And when you look that up, 41 is just the bytecode for capital A. Yeah. And looking at our stack, we can see that we have completely filled this stack with, well, not completely, but we've filled the stack with a buttload of A, capital A's. Yeah, and presumably because the instruction pointer is that value, what's happened is we've gotten to an instruction A, an instruction that said jump to this place. Yeah, and so the, the EIP, one. which is the instruction pointer, is saying go to this memory address, but that memory memory address either doesn't exist or doesn't allow execution. And so that's yeah. the question. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, unlike some of the other debugging we've done where the debugger is quite you know nice and neat and showing you the decompiled um, app when you're running it, this isn't as nice for like searching around um, I guess you could open this in Ghidra and hunt around in Ghidra as well, but that's not how Jake ended up doing this. Yeah, so we're not going to go into the code and try and find the exact point in the code that has the buffer overflow or show any of that kind of stuff off. Um, all we're going to do is focus on the buffer overflow side of things. So now yep. that we know that two and a half thousand A's will cause the app to crash, we want to figure out exactly how many A's we need to make the app crash. Yeah. And to do that, we use our, a tool we've used in the past called uh, Pattern Create. So Pattern Create generates a non-repeating uh, string yes. of characters. So effectively, you dump that into your the app's buffer, it'll overflow, and you will figure out, um, it helps you figure out at what point the overflow happens so that you know where you need to jump uh, to put your jump. So what will get is the EIP will end up with um, some bytes that will correlate with a particular part of that string, and then that will tell us how many bytes in is our ability to take control. Yep. So, so that's in that <laughs> we can then put in a memory address for somewhere we want it to go and we can get it to jump there and start running the the code we want it to run, which is your basic vanilla buffer overflow. Yeah. This is not vanilla buffer overflow. It just so happens to be an actual app. Yeah, exactly. So um, the pattern create, as we can see, has created a 2,500 character long random series of characters. And when we dump this in and crash the app, this time we can see that instead of getting um, for one, for one, for one. For one. So we're getting a different set of characters, I guess, in EIP. Well, at, the, at this point, when we're dealing with things in registers, they're not characters, they're just bytes or binary, binary for, data. For us right now, they're characters. Yeah, um, I guess, yeah, actually, good point. <laughs> uh, and then MSF pattern, uh, you can then give it that same set of bytes back. Yeah, so uh, Pattern Create has a kind of, I guess, partner, sister app called Pattern Offset. Oh, Pattern Offset, my bad, yeah. And you yeah. give it the, um, so we give it the particular value. string back and okay. it'll tell you how bytes in that occurred. Yep. Well, it was 396F4338. See what we get. And we can see when we do that, that the exact match for the offset is 2006. 
2006 bytes in and we get our, our address we control. Now for the math. Which is interesting because that's not what we got last time, but that's okay. Fuck it. Did you, did you get that? Or did, did you get the memory address? The offset? Uh, it's off by one, but it's fine. It should be fine. Okay. It's off yeah. by enough that we can fix it. Uh, so now pretty much what we do is exactly what we just did. So we're going to print instead of two and a half thousand bytes we're, or capital A's, we're going to do 2006 A's. And then we're also going to print two B's or four, four, B's. four B's. So we'll do two four C's. B's and four C's. <coughs> So now we grab, oh, now I just have to reset everything. This was a challenge is it is a little bit. It's a bit kind of finicky to get started with this kind of stuff because every time you crash the app, you crash the app. So you have to rerun it and reattach the debug debugger and all that kind of stuff, uh, which is fine because it doesn't take too long. Cool, that's all attached and we'll just make sure it's running and now we connect back to FTP again. And we're gonna copy our same thing again. And so now we can see when we look at EIP, it's filled with 4.2 all the way through, which is our capital Bs. And if we look at the stack, we've got all of our Bs, all of our As, and then right down the bottom, we should see four twos and then our four threes. Four Cs, yep. And <clears throat> you kind of want everything nicely lined up. Getting, getting three bytes in doesn't really mean you've got enough control. <laughs> Yeah, which is weird because the EIP is all four twos, which is what we want. Um, um, the stack think, itself isn't lined up. I think we've seen this before where you get weird stuff like that happening. Yeah, but that's okay. We'll keep going because we'll get it working. Uh, so now that we know that we can control the EIP, which is the next address on the stack that the application is going to try and run. Uh, what we're going to do is um, run a, I'll call it exploit three because we're going to run it in Python three, is we're going to script this out a bit so that we, we're not uh, echoing characters and doing all that kind of stuff. So this is a pretty common, let me just go insert mode, there we go. This is a fairly common um, buffer overflow kind of shell script, if you like. Um, so what we've got is an empty spot for our shell code when we eventually generate it. Our buffer, which is all of our A's. Our EIP, which is what we want to control and change to a address on the stack that we that actually executes code. And then we've just got a bunch of padding, which is our C's. Yep. Um, the general structure is you're going to have all those, well, as Jake said, all those A's get to the EIP, and that address that we want to put an EIP is going to jump us to, are we using a, yeah, we use a bunch of NOPs in this one, don't we? It's called yeah, a NOP we sled. Will. We will. Yeah. Effectively, a no operation just means go to the next, um, <clears throat> like, instruction in the um, binary, and what you tend to do is you treat your, they call it like a NOP sled. Um, I think of it like a target. You want your EIP to be targeting somewhere in there so it'll continue on down until it gets to your shell code. Yeah. And then you so have, we'll we can have demonstrate that here with this. Uh, with, uh, yeah, this. Yeah, I'm, I'm choppy because Discord disagrees with my audio interface. I can't fix it. It's been a problem for like a year. I probably should just get a new audio interface. <laughs> it's a Discord thing, yeah. Is it? It's not that you're too loud and clipping or something, is it? No, no, no. no. It's uh, I come across as a bit choppy. You'll you'll be hearing it too. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can hear it too. Yeah. No, it's just 
the joys of Discord. Anyway, back to... Uh, yeah, so now that we've got our app reset and debugging again, we can basically run this script again, except give me permission to... Oh, that's not what it's called. Give me permission to execute it. And then we need to also fix the type mode, probably. Uh, where are we, Sendy? Uh, oh yeah, here. those two spends need... Oh no, they're being encoded. Yep. Those ones are encoded, that one's not. That one doesn't need to be... Yep, it does. Should, it should do. The dir does. Because the rest of that's bytes, but the... Um, yeah, it's just Python farm. Yep, like that. Um, just the word uh, The rest of that's fine. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. Let's do so, that. What, <clears throat> what kind of is kind of funny is we... that that The uh, kind of format that you see and a lot of the exploit DB scripts are kind of in that similar format. They're all written for Python 2. And when you have uh, when you have strings and bytes in Python two, it's really ambiguous, and in Python three, it's also a bit finicky. Uh, oh, the last one as well was technically a string, the RN. Um, it's weird that I didn't have to do this last time, but that's okay. We'll do it this time and see. Uh, uh, so you're so. Yeah, yeah, points. Okay, cool. Yeah. And cool. Okay. We well, can see that we're off by one, but that's because we I copy pasted the um the script and we just need to adjust our buffer yeah. a little bit, but that's fine. But yeah, so what we were seeing is what we're looking at this time is like you were saying, the reason we have all of those C's is to create some space on the stack for our shellcode to go. So we can look yep. at our ESP register, which is our stack pointer. And if we follow this in dump, we can see down here that the memory address uh, 9ECE0, which is the memory address of the stack pointer, is kind of right. It's not at the start of our Cs, but it's kind of in the middle of our Cs. And that's why we're using going to use NOPS as like a NOPS sled because we don't want our shell code to be missing these three bytes. We want the code to execute for a little bit and then start running our shell code. And that's what the NOPS sled is. It also creates some good padding for if you've got a staged shell code that has to kind of expand on the stack and sometimes that runs out of space and then doesn't expand properly and then your exploit doesn't work. Always a challenge. And we don't want that to happen. So we're just going to fill as much as we can of this with some knots so that we've got plenty of room for our shellcode to work. Cool. And again, just no, I just got to reset jumping. it again. So every time we crash it, we got to reset it. Funny enough, for me, when I was doing this, I couldn't attach it. I always had to start the process with the debugger, which wouldn't work half the time. Uh, or whatever, but that was, I wasn't doing it in a VM, I was doing it on my laptop, so. Yeah, so because we're off by one, we're just going to drop that one down so that we don't see yeah. an A anymore, we, we will see the four Bs. I also quickly to mention the bit near the bottom, so connecting to the server via TCP on port 21, which is your standard FTP, uh, the receive 1024 is just receive uh, a thousand and a bit bytes, and then the user anonymous pass anonymous is the just the blind login actually i think you get a banner back but anyway that's just blindly firing the login which we can do because anonymous is allowed in this app and uh we, even though we're sending the command dir, i'm pretty sure so any command or any valid string will work it doesn't really care uh it's the issue isn't specifically in the handling of the dir thing in fact the actual exploit used the rename ftp instruction and i'm pretty sure the way it does the string processing, you could just have the command be a string that's overly long, it would also break. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, hey, Grub. Hey, Grub. We've we've not been on in a very long time, so... <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Glad that um, you could catch us. Uh, yeah. yeah, so before we generate our shellcode, shellcode can have all sorts of bytes in it. <laughs> COVID-2 hasn't helped, yeah. I mean, it should have helped, but it didn't. We went the opposite direction. Um, yeah, so before we generate our shellcode, we've got, like, potentially a bunch of different bytes that act differently depending on the application that we are um, yeah. like trying to exploit. The, so The simplest example is 0, zero is often a string terminator. Yeah, and exactly. so your vulnerability, I think, involves any of the string handling functions. It'll get to zero, 0, I think the string's ended, and you won't get to your buffer. And then it'll copy the string or whatever. Yeah, so zero zero is the null byte character, and basically for anything that's like a string copy, it'll signify that it's the end of the string, so the app will just kind of stop and it won't continue with the rest. Yeah. Of, like it won't continue processing the rest of that string, which means it won't yeah. continue and executing our shellcode. There's a whole um, bunch of other character, and yeah, depending on the environment or yeah. bytes actually, I guess. So signify different things. And so you got to avoid them. Yeah. So that, yeah. And because we're dealing with FTP, so things like um, line feeds and character returns and things like that also could potentially signify that the inputted command is done. So the app will terminate and start kind of doing other things. So the way that we test for bad characters is we pretty much send it everything from zero to ff because we're dealing in hex so that is every bytecode and when we run this we'll take a look at the stack and we'll be able to see which characters it doesn't like and then we can slowly go from there we're not going to do all of them i'll just show an example of one um that's not backspace so yeah i'll just show an example of one and then Oh, I've already prepared which ones the bad characters are for this app because there's quite a few and it would take forever. It did take forever. Uh, yep, that's all set up and running again. Cool. Now we're just going to rerun our exploit. So we can see uh, adjusting all of those A's, our EIP is now all B's again, which is nice. And if we look at this in here, I went too far there. So we can see here that instead of starting at zero one, oh, actually zero one's there. So we've got zero two, three, four, five, all the way up to nine. But then after zero nine, the next character isn't zero A which is what we're expecting, uh, yeah, zero A, which is what we're expecting it to be. Yeah. So because of that, that means that zero A is considered a bad character, which I think is another one of those, uh, it's like a line feed or something like that as well. Yeah. Um, Effectively, all it boils down to is in a byte, can mean different things depending on the context. The string copy function will act on them as far as it understands them. So a zero, zero, it'll end the string. I think there are others that are a bit like that. Yeah. The FTP app itself has some control logic that it'll go, oh, no, that character means this, so I'll stop. So uh, with FTP, you can transfer things by binary mode or text mode. Um, so I'm guessing that's like the some of the things you get there, um, which was why when we were debugging this earlier today, I think those, the, effectively the line breaks would end up within the string. Yeah, yeah I think that's what was happening. Yeah, yeah. So just to, I guess, kind of prove that point, what we've done is remove that 0A from the bad character string. And this is how you determine if a character is bad or not. You send them all, you delete the first one that's bad, and then you rerun the exact same thing again, scroll down, try and find where we were up to. And this time we can see now that we go straight from 09 to 0B, which is what we want, because that's our new order. Continuing on, 0C, there's no 
Zero D. So Zero D is another bad character. Rinse and repeat until eventually we get a list of all of our bad characters, which are... And... Oh, insert mode will help. Those ones. So those are all of our bad characters when it comes to generating our shellcode. And yeah, there's quite a few. So that was fun. Yeah. And I think the, so that's important when you're generating your shell code. Yes. So either if that's you're do hand doing your shell code, you need to avoid any instructions which involve those particular bytes, or we're just going to be lazy and use um, MSFN and you can tell it, avoid using these characters. Exactly. And use, like, you know, there's more than in, you know, when you're down to like the, I guess you could call it machine code, or assembly level, there's more than one way to program your way around a problem. It's like if you're asked to code something, but you weren't allowed to use for loops. Just use You just use, like, whiles and counters instead. Like, yeah. there's, you know. And so that's all it does, is it just avoids those instructions. Yeah, I'm pretty guessing that so. circumstances where it can't build an app, um, because there's just too many, but... It'll probably, I think it errors or you have to tell it to use a different type of encoding or platform and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, yeah we're not going to go into writing our own shellcode this time. We'll just use MSFN to generate it ourselves. But basically the way that we'll, what we do is the dash P is selecting a payload. So there's a massive list of different uh, shellcode payloads that you can pick in MSFN and we're just going with the Windows reverse TCP reverse shell because we know it's a Windows box that we're attacking. The L host is my local, um, my Kali attacker machine IP address, and the port is going to be the port that I'm listening on. The dash B is all of our bad characters, so we stick those in. The F is the output format, so we're going to output this in C format because it's Windows and it probably runs C binaries, and same with the platform, the platform is Windows. Yeah. Here we could do dash F Python if we knew that the target had Python on it. And then, like you said, it would encode it differently. So it might have a better way of handling the bad characters and stuff like that. But for this, cause it's windows, it's a clean windows that I actually don't think has Python installed on it. So we're just going to yeah. run the standard C windows binary. Oh, CMD you mean? No, like, um, C the programming language. Oh, my like bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Language. You gonna do something, little window? Come on, you can do it. I hit enter. Oh, jeez, waiting. Uh oh, oh shit! It's not like waiting. That. When in doubt, just run the same command again. Let me run that again, and maybe be a bit more patient this time. Oh, did you control C it? Yeah, I don't think it likes the fact that I'm streaming this time. So my um. All right. My yeah. Whole little all, that, all control C does really means okay. it'll bump the stack. Awesome. And yeah. this is, yeah, this is it. Kind of. Yeah. Now you've got to like reformat that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll be back in a momente. Oh okay, yeah. Cool. Um, because I'm a total noob, I'm just gonna use this to reformat it. Because uh, we want to just get rid of all of those. Basically, we're just trying to make it all on one line, which we can do quickly and easily here. Delete and delete and. and, delete and, delete and delete. There's probably an automate. Uh, like a macro or a command or something I could do to do this, but it's probably quicker to just do this than it is to look it up. So again, we're just getting this on one line. Whoops, that's not supposed to do that. So that's nice in our Python script because we found when we were running this in Python 3, 
that it was picking up those new line characters and it was changing the stack, which was not good. Uh, oh, is that the command to get rid of it? Yeah, probably. For um for Vim. That's okay. I did it this way. I didn't have, <laughs> cause I'm the one streaming. I don't have um, Twitch chat open. So it's too late. Oh, okay. We'll have just go to the quotes. That's all right. So now we've got shell code, which I'm just gonna dump in here as binary data because that's what it is. Or bytes, I should say. And we can replace our bad characters with our padding again, because our padding is still C's. We're gonna change that to, uh, we don't really need 100. We might just go 50 to see if it makes anything quicker. Uh, and the bytecode for NOPS is 90. So now the only thing left to do is figure out how we replace this or what we replace the Bs with. So over here, we want our application, which is our next instruction pointer to point to this stack address. But this stack address won't always be the same if there's um, ASLR or something like that on the machine. So we can't just hard code this value, the 19ECE0. So what we have to do is find somewhere in this application where there's a jump ESP command and point it to that instead, because that should always be static. It'll be in a library somewhere. So then when we overwrite the EIP with a jump ESP instruction, it'll basically go to that memory address in that library find that it's a jump ESP instruction and jump us to this point on the stack, which will be somewhere in the middle of our C's, or in this case, because this was our bad character test, somewhere in the middle of our bad characters. And then it'll not slide all the way down until it hits our shell code and start executing code. So because that's crashed, I've got to reset it all again. And this is how long Windows takes to play catch up. Oh man, it's crashed a lot. Okay, cool. Reset everything. Come on little computer, you can do it. Yay. Next is the debugger. It's getting slower and slower the longer the night goes on. Always fun. Come on, you can do it. I told you to do it, open. Oh boy, okay, cool. So we'll just reattach to that. FTP server, go, wait for it. So basically what it's doing now is attaching to that process, figuring out all the libraries that it's calling in the background, doing all that kind of stuff, reading the memory, cause the memory is obviously bigger than just what that one binary is using um, and trying to just figure itself out. Yeah, to poor little Intel. I think this VM actually only has one CPU as well, which doesn't help. It's like one CPU and one gig of RAM or something. So yeah, that obviously doesn't help. It's probably like the absolute minimum that Windows 10 will run on. Um, cool, so now that we've done that, we've got our padding that's all NOPs and we, are, we won't int introduce the shellcode just yet. We'll do that later, that's fine. Okay, cool, and we're gonna save that one and rerun it. Oh, Apple 
crash, which is I nice. have returned. Yay. So in Ollie Debugger, we're going to press this little E, which opens all of the um, modules. So these are all of the modules that the PC FTP application runs, all the DLLs, all that kind of stuff. You can find, I don't think, there used to be for Immunity, a plugin that would do all this for you automatically, but it's a good learning opportunity to kind of do it yourself as well manually. So what we're going to do is kind of just pick any DLL in here that we think might have a jump ESP command. Yeah, it's pretty much an Intel Atom. Um, yeah, this is the, the joy of like InfoSec is like while CTFs and um, challenges tend to make things easy, Real life vulnerability, like pen testing, is like ninety percent. All right, I'll try this one. Didn't work. I'll try this one. Yeah, exactly. So what we've done now, we just double click that DLL and we've opened up all of the instructions that are in that DLL. And from here, we can just search directly for the command that we're after. And we're looking for a jump ESP somewhere in here. And we can see that it's found a bunch. And we're pretty much just going to work from the top. We can go through different ones. I think it's the, I want to say it's the C, but it might actually be the M. Yeah, the memory window. Uh, so in here, you can look at the permissions of the memory addresses. So if you've got, uh, I guess, read, write, execute type permissions, and if there's depth protection and all that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't go into that much because I know that this app doesn't have any of that enabled. But if you needed to, if the first one in the list didn't work, you could go and find a memory address and a jump ESP that you have permission to execute. So we're just going to take the first one because I'm pretty sure it should work. And because we're working in... Oops, that's the wrong one. We want to vim exploit. Because we're working in little Indian land, uh, we have to reverse it. And you can kind of see that in, um, oh, it's not quite open there, but in the stack, we can see that all of our bad characters were actually kind of working from right to left, not from left to right. So to make things easier, I'm just gonna write it in here. 75BD. Oops, why didn't that type? There we go. So we've got 75BD, D2, D4. Hello? There we go. So it's fun when it uh, decides not to respond. Yeah, don't know why it was doing that. Uh, so now we're going to basically just replace those four Bs with those um, these bytes instead. So B, B4 is first because we're working backwards. Then we've got D2. Then we've got BD. And then we've got, oh, slash X would help. Uh, 75. So now in theory, we've got everything that we need to run the exploit. We've got our buffer set to the right length. We've got our EIP controlled to a pointer that will jump ESP. And we've got a bunch of knops and all we have to do is actually add in our shellcode. Without that would be nice. And fingers crossed, that's all we have to do. <laughs> Did you also mention on the shell code why we, we've got a B inverted that whole B at the start of the string? Because uh, that was a whole bit of fun. No, not really. <laughs> no, I did not. Um, <clears throat> we can talk about it later. <laughs> okay. Just, just charge ahead. Cool. So because we crashed the app, we've got to re run it again. We could just YOLO it and not debug it. 
If we think we're going to get it, yeah. Uh, sure, why not? Uh, so we set up a listener because when we generated our shell code, we told um, the reverse shell to connect back to us on port 444. So we're just going to set up a little listener and hope it connects back to us when we run the exploit. Uh, go. We can see that the app crashed and we can see that we didn't get a shell. So that means that we do need to debug. Yay. All right, let's do it the long way. File attach back to that. Go. Uh, we the CPU one. Let that run. I think it's thinking really hard. I don't know if you can hear that fan spinning up, but that's my computer fan spinning up. No, I can. <clears throat> I can hear the uh, jet aircraft in the background. Yeah. I, uh, I keep going to mute so I can cough because I've had a cough for like the last week and I keep hitting the share screen button instead of the mute button. Oh, Jake, I think your audio might have died. I think it's Jake. I don't know if you can hear me because I'm going to the same computer as him. <laughs> oh, someone's someone's having fun. Uh, Jake, your audio has gone squeaky. This is weird. Like, okay, so Jake's running OBS on his computer. I'm on Discord, so he's just pushing the audio through that way, and his audio has died, and my and mine hasn't. That's weird. Because like he's gone squeaky on Discord too. All right. <clears throat> Hello. Nope. I think you might still be squeaky. Oh, my audio is fine now. Oh, poor Jake. Poor poor Jake. Rip. No, I, I can't hear you, Jake. Well, I should probably actually type to. So I'm just telling Jake uh, that I'm giving him some tech support. Oh, and the comsec boys have IT issues. Oh, yes. It's a bit like that. It's just funny whenever some big provider has an outage and all the tweets going to all the people having technical issues, uh, like, or, you know, to all their technicians, good luck. Yeah, his mic died. Um, okay. We could either try doing this blind and he just does stuff on the screen and I try and explain it. Um, <clears throat> that, that'd be super fun. Um, it might actually involve Jake, you unplugging and replugging your interface in and seeing if OBS doesn't freak out. All right, he's, uh, I mean, yes. I'm yes. getting this all delayed as well because now I've only got it on Twitch. Um, but he's he's in terminal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. You're back. Hello, am I back? Yeah, am yeah, yeah. Squeaky? Did I plug and get re plug and get in work? I mean, I guess so. Great. Yeah, yeah. That was that was high quality. 
Okay, awesome. Yeah, otherwise I was just going to have to start guessing what you were doing. And be like, at this point, he's, uh, no, Jake, don't. The stream's still running. Don't type that into the URL bar. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, put three. Oh, yep, yeah, you are sharing. Okay, cool. Right, now let's get back to it. Where were we? Uh, so none of this was any different. Oh, are so you just grabbing Python 2? The one we did earlier. Yeah. So this is the one I, I did the... earlier that's no different, except I just realized it's run actually running Python 2, not Python 3. Oh, that's why we had all those bloody issues with the strings, mate. Yeah, that's why we had string issues. Oh, gosh. Anyway, we had like a... <laughs> this is correct, Moral. I would have... That's where this would have gone. Just be like, who is this man? Why did I decide to do anything with him? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How could you do that? <clears throat> Um, no, Jake, that's not how you spell colour. It's got a U in it. <laughs> classic. Classic uh, debate. We want this one, and we want to do that because we want this guy here. Yeah, so what we're going to do, over lunch, Jake did mostly get this working, and then I chipped in. I thought I was solving a Python 3 string problem, but it was really a Python 2 string problem, so... As it turns out, Python 2 is messed up, which is why no one should be using it anymore. But, you know, yeah, people love much. it. So, <laughs> but I don't like sticking brackets in my print statements. It's too hard. Or something like that. <laughs> um, I think it's basically boils down to Python 2 is ambiguous as to the format of the strings, whereas Python 3 is less Oops. ambiguous as to the actual format of strings. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay, so I gotta call that again. Yeah, and start again with the Python 2 version. I mean, there's functionally no difference. No, there's other than the, exactly the same, it's just that. Other than the fact that form. Python 2 seems to be handling the strings the way we expect them to be handled. Yeah. I would imagine in Python 3, we probably don't need that B because it'll just figure that out for us because they're already encoded that way. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Nope. Oh, man. This is the greatest example of, like, no plan survives first contact. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it's because that, um, like, it's off by one in the stack, and I'm not entirely sure. Uh, no, that. Python 2 takes just as much effort as Python 3. It's mostly, there's a few differences, like, in terms of how you have to write things. Um, so morals going to out them as not being super technical. So when I say write them a bit differently, I mean, syntax is different. Um, <clears throat> but, um, sorry, moral, I didn't mean to insult you, but you know, I, I do it because I know you can handle it. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> where was I, uh, we had this working and now it's not, which is always great. I swear it was working, guys. It worked on my laptop. It did work on my laptop, guys. Uh, because that should be the same anyway. Yeah. AZ Kiwi's got it. It's that's one of the most obvious differences, and the other one is the way it thinks about strings. Um, yeah. So in Python 3, all strings are uh, Unicode um, versus having to explicitly encode things into Unicode in Python 2 so that you can send it to places that expect that. I think, oh man, I always get it wrong. It's because I never did much Python 2. Um, all right, let's just use a different one. Uh, let's try that one. A different jump. Yeah, let's try a different jump, see if that does it. So, 75db. I guess the advantage of it going off the rails is this is 
kind of real life in pen tests and stuff like that. You go, you're thrown into a pen test with a, an app or a language or something you've got passing familiarity with. Because your actual expertise isn't knowing everything on the face of the planet. It's being able to figure stuff out. And you go and read up on theoretical attacks. And because you don't have the actual original source code, you can't tell if something's been done a certain way. So you have to poke around at arm's length. And that's, that's what we're doing here is... That should literally be... Uh, yeah. Cool. I think earlier you said that, like, because um, you gave it a quick test run before the stream and you were like, oh, it's all, my memory address has changed, which is potentially just every time you start up Windows, there's, oh, I'm trying to remember, there's like two two sorts of address space randomization. Yeah. There's like app level and then the operating system can do it too. Yeah, um, so it, it could have been a number of things. Like it could have been this first memory address that we were using for Jump ESP. Like I kind of mentioned, we didn't have execute permissions on that memory address or something. Um, but basically, so what I just did there was pretty much uh, just update that EIP to be the next one in the list. Um, and the next time I ran it, you can see that our reverse shell actually got a response uh, and we can do a who am I and all that kind of stuff. And we the real owned the box. The real funny thing about buffer overflows, I think a lot of them are, are still found in like what you consider legacy apps or apps that may still be getting updated but were written originally in the like 90s or 2000s. Um, and they've just never had those issues fixed. Is They solve problems. There are compiler flags that make buffer overflows a lot harder to pull off. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the app might still crash, but... Uh, it doesn't lead to code execute like a, a sh reverse shell like that. Um, but, you know, to turn those flags on means regression testing. And in a big big corporate, you're a software company with a big C-based app. Regression testing and fixing equals money. So you turn on those safety compiler flags. And that could be, depending on the company, a anywhere from like a 50000 to half million dollar project just to turn on the flags to stop our overflows. Uh, why, like, you know, newer languages like Rust and Go don't have the issues that C does. Um, C even has functions but in the standard of the library, I think, that are safer than the, uh, like, string copy and stuff like that. Um, i trying to remember, like, there's printf and then there's sprint. And um, I think sprint's the safe one. I might be wrong. You know, all these things. But the problem here is ancient code, which is why we'll probably still have these things for another 30, 40 years. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's about it, I suppose. Yeah, so that's kind of it. So basically, we kind of, I guess, got a little sidetracked because I like, it was Python 3 and it wasn't, uh, which didn't happen. I guess if we just quickly run through the steps at the end just to summarize it. Sure. So uh, we found or we were running an application that took user input. We filled that user input with an absurdly long string and the application crashed, which led us to believe that there's a buffer overflow in there somewhere. So then we started debugging the app and we noticed that when we crash the app, we control or we overwrite EIP. Then to try and take control of EIP, we used pattern create to come up with a unique string of characters that we could then use to determine the length of our buffer before we control EIP. And then we added a couple of extra characters just to prove that anything that we enter there gets dumped on EIP. So I guess confirming that we control that. After that, we looked at whatever some bad characters were for the application. And we have to do that every time because every application handles characters differently and some characters that are bad in one won't necessarily be bad in others, except pretty much always the null byte character. So we always add that to the bad character list. Um, I think it's pretty rare that that doesn't happen. Um, so to do that, we just do the hex characters from zero to F and 
one by one go through and remove any that mess up with the stack at when the application crashes and eventually we should see every character in our bad character string printed on the stack and that means that we found them all from there we generated some shell code using those bad character well adding a param a function argument for those bad characters to tell the shell code generator not to include any of those uh, we added all of that to our script our exploit script and then we went hunting for a jump esp memory address because our shell code gets dumped in esp we want our execution flow to go into esp so that our shell code executes so to do that we just hunted around a few dlls that are being loaded by the program and searched for a jump esp memory address and added that in as our to replace our b's that were overriding eip um, the first one that we tested didn't quite work so we had to pick a different one and once we did that we kind of just stuck it all together into this shell code well into this exploit python script uh, so we've got our shell code which is our reverse shell our buffer which is just everything leading up to our control over eip our eip characters which we well bytes which are just the memory address that we found for a jump esp command we added some padding which is just a bunch of knops because our um, ESP ends up being halfway in between our padding so we don't want it to mess up our shell code and then when the application runs it hits the padding does a bunch of knops hits the shell code shell code executes we have a listener running on our, on our attack box and it hits it and we get a shell that's kind of it S I guess simple. that's the TLDR that's how simple it is so easy yeah, the, the there's some head screwiness in there. Like you've got to have the like the um, the oh, the memory location we want to jump the pointer to to then do a jump PSP, and we need those like memory addresses in the right places so that like it does what you want it to do. And every time that happens, I always spend half an hour agonizing trying to understand how it works. Um. This is what happens when you don't do. Was it? Who was I talking to? I was talking to someone earlier today. Where you don't, if you don't do something often enough, you kind of forget. And buffer overflow has done something outside of CTFs. You actually do super commonly. I mean, unless you're doing a pen test and you actually have to hit a binary. Uh, the only other thing I'd say, as well, for when you when you you don't have to worry about null bytes is when it's an overflow relating to just passing a generic binary data. I think mem copy yeah. sort of stuff, which most stuff just takes a string, which is all FTP takes, but that's just another aside. That would be the only circumstance I could think of where like a zero zero is probably allowed. It's when you're not actually... Yeah, I mean, there are cases where zero zero isn't a bad character, but I think it's far less common than... Yeah. Um... Oh, well, <laughs> print dev and string copy uh, problems. Anyway... We're at the we're at the end of the hour. Yeah, pretty much right on the hour, which is nice. Any um, luck, we'll be back next week. Yeah, we'll probably touch but, briefly on a lot of these steps, but we might skip over them just because, as we get into more and more complicated buffer overflows, we're gonna have to kind of have some assumed knowledge around things like generating shell code, doing our um, yeah. pattern create and pattern offset and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, moving forward. We're still going to stick on the buffer overflows, but we're going to move into some more complicated ones. Yeah. Well, for the next couple of weeks anyway, and then we'll figure something else out to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Back with more buffer overflow and enthusiast content. That's it. Cheers, guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks for tuning for in. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.